Welcome to the StoryCraft Cafe. Come in, grab a cup of your favorite beverage, and get ready to join the storytelling conversation. StoryCraft Cafe is brought to you by Dabble, the ultimate cloud-based fiction writing software. Here we're going to bring together storytellers from all walks to encourage and empower you to craft your best story. It's another Friday here in the StoryCraft Cafe. Thanks for joining us again. We've got a great show for you today. Victoria Benton Frank is a new author who is just launching her author career, but she has a really interesting story because she was raised by a very popular author, and if you uh, are familiar with with uh, women's fiction, you will most definitely know her mom and you know what it was like to grow up with a powerful figure like that in your home and you know what uh, what do people expect from you when when you take up that mantle as well a, a great conversation you're going to love it victoria benton frank a, a phenomenal guest uh thank you as always to dabble for making this show possible if you are an author and you are looking to streamline your writing process visit dabblewriter.com and jump in to the very best writing software there is hang on to your hat that visit us over at storycraft.cafe to stay abreast of all upcoming shows and these live author hangouts that we have where you can interact live uh, during the the YouTube live portion or uh, or and uh, be sure to subscribe to this podcast channel in whatever app you like to get podcasts from so you never miss an episode. Now on to our show. Well, thank you for joining us here in the Storycraft Cafe. I am so excited to have Victoria Benton Frank on the show with me today. She's got a brand new book that just dropped yesterday, and it is called My Magnolia Summer. And I'm reaching here so I can show you my brand new hardcover copy of it. Uh, amazing book. You're going to love this. Um, what a what a great book to start summer off with, uh, Victoria. This is um, it, it brought me so much joy. So I know it's going to for a lot of people. But uh, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. And I hope everyone feels like it's a great book for the summer. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Victoria, we're, uh, I love to start the conversation off with a fun question. And okay. so here's one I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to toss over to you. Oh. What is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Wow. Um, <laughs> first memory of wanting. I don't know what my first memory of wanting to be a storyteller was, but yeah. I remember when I was called to be a storyteller. Oh, Is that... I, I, I love it. Yeah. So I was riding more. In the car with my wild in-laws at the time. They were my boyfriend's parents and we're going on this crazy road trip all around the country of Italy to visit family. And I was in the car and I was thinking about life and I was looking at this beautiful landscape and I heard a voice like, like it sounds very woo woo, but I heard a voice that was like, you're going to write books like your mom. And I was wow. like, I don't know where that's coming from. And I don't know if it was because I was in like a deep reflection or if I was praying and I didn't know what, it, you know what I mean? Like it's sort yeah. of I was in like that state. Um, and I will never forget it because it was such a like moment for me and I put it off. I didn't do yeah. anything with that for years. And then my mom started putting it in my ear and she was like, you know, you should be a writer too. Like you're funny. You're good at selling, telling stories. And I was like, no, 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 no. Like I'm an artist. I'm creative like you are, but I am a storyteller with dance or theater or with food or, you know, I did all these other creative fields. Um, I was kind of running away from my destiny. <laughs> and then, um, you know, mama always knows best. Like she called oh, yeah. it, she knew what was happening. Uh, so I think that, that, that I started, to write in secret and sort of, sort of sort of evolved on its own like but yeah so i don't remember my first memory of like wanting to be a storyteller i think i've always been a storyteller like i used to write plays yeah. and put on shows when i was a little girl 
um, because I always loved theater. Uh, But I think I knew I was called to be a writer at a certain time. This is a a a topic that I've explored for ten years of of doing author podcast. Is is there a a writer gene? Like, are are we born storytellers? You know, in in a lot of ways, the the human creature is a storyteller. Yeah, I was going to say that. Yeah, it's kind Um, of survival. Like, it's sort of yeah, you know, around a campfire kind of thing. Like, it's very primal to to tell stories. So I think in every tribe there's got to be one you know because we keep the entertainment going right so and i think stories like i said earlier sort of you know stories are told in different ways sometimes in songs sometimes writing sometimes you know just telling stories about like family history or whatever um memories you know so i don't know i don't know if there's a gene but there's certainly a role that needs to be filled you know, like there's a caretaker yeah. in the family. There's a, you know, someone's a hunter, someone's a gatherer, you know, like that kind of stuff. I think yes. it is primal to be a storyteller, but I do also think it's a gift. I mean, yeah. I, I hope I have it. I hope I'm not a huge hack, but my mother definitely had a gift and there are certainly people who either got it or they don't, you know, and it's, yeah. it's a craft that you hone, you get better at it, but it's a seed that's either in you or it's not. Yeah. Well, that, you know, if you, if you gather a hundred people in a room and you say, how many of you think you have a story in you that you would like to tell? I, I think a, a lot of hands of would go. Yeah. A almost everyone would put their hands up. Yeah. And you know, I think writing a book is a lot like owning a restaurant. Like I say this all the mm. time, like my husband's a chef, the, the number one failing industry you can be in is opening your own, your own restaurant because yes. everyone tells stories. Everybody cooks everybody thinks they can be a chef and everyone thinks they can be an author. It's a very different thing. And I think I've learned to get to here step by step, but being an author and being a writer are two different things. And then being an aspiring writer and being an actual, so there's levels, you know, but, and it takes a lot of different things I think to be, to do it. And I'm learning the discipline, which is not my favorite. I don't like that word. (laughs) So that's what I'm not good at yet. And I'm working yeah. on it, but you know, I'll, I'll get there. But as of yesterday, I'm an author. So that's really, yes, exciting. you are. Yes, yeah. you are. Yes. <laughs> and that's, that is something no one can ever take away from you. That's right. Harper yeah. Collins made it official. Thank you, William Morrow. <laughs> that's right. That's right. You, yeah. you've mentioned your mother a couple of times, mm-hmm. uh, the, the illustrious Dorothea, uh, Benton Frank and yeah. who, who stamped her mark on, uh, on, on the literary world yeah. what, almost 30 years ago when she published her first book. Um, yeah, let's, yeah, that would be about right. Almost 30 because I'm yeah. going to be 38 in November. And so wow. she started when I was like eight, like seven or eight. Yeah. So it's about uh, around that time. Yeah. Yep. Well, what was it like growing up in the house with, with someone, you know, that larger than life uh, for one, but then also who told stories that were, larger than life and that so many people loved and you know it's it's like you you have mom and then you also have to share her with the rest of the world what what was that like um I never felt like I was like there was a problem with me sharing her with the rest of the world I always thought it was such an honor it was very clear to me that I was able to go to those private schools and go on those vacations because of the rest of the world (laughs) investing in my mother so I was touche yeah, you know what I mean? Like, I was yeah. always like, yeah, you want an autograph? Like, come on, you want to buy one book? <laughs> buy two. Like, you know, it was never like a, um, that, so that was, and it was normal for us. Yeah. It, it, it's had, there were sometimes it got weird. Like if we were at a restaurant and we were having a really serious conversation between the two of us and someone could, would come up, sometimes it was a little bit like, I'm really just trying to have dinner with my mom and we're in the middle of something, you know, but at the same time, it's like, <laughs> I really want to say hello to you. And I know this took a lot to come to this table. So like, you know, right. Um, but growing up with her for the most part, actually, well, I will say her entire fair fan base, save like one or two out of, we're talking millions of people are lovely, real people. Like, yeah. I, I think it would be a different story if my mother was Stephen King because the fan base is different. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah, but for okay. my mom, they're all like women like me. They drive minivans. They got kids. They know mean casserole. Like they're not, <laughs> You know, like they're not like yeah. they're normal and they want to see right. her succeed and they want to see me succeed. So it's like this really cool dynamic of just expanding my family. Um, but growing up with my mother in the house, we all have larger than life personalities. And so it 
was really a competition to see who could make the other one laugh, like who could be funnier, who could be smarter, who could be more clever. It yeah. wasn't about beating the other person, but it was about being the winner of like joy spreading. Like it was yeah. never like I could get away with anything as long as I made you laugh. Like I didn't really have a curfew because my mom was like, go ahead and stay late. Try to go to school tomorrow. See how that feels. Like it was never, (laughs) you know, she was just very like, but whatever you think it was, it was times a million. And Mm -hmm. she was a believer in magic and making magic happen. And holidays were unbelievable in my home. And they still are. I mean, like I carry that on now. Um, And it's a lot of work, you know, but she's, she wanted to make those memories happen. And so every day was a celebration. Every day was a gift, you know, so we never went to bed angry. And, but my mom and I, she made me believe that the rules didn't apply to her and I, like Mm. we were in a club, just the two of us. And so I could achieve anything I wanted because my mom could achieve anything she wanted and it it didn't apply to us. And like, it didn't matter that we, and still I'm living like that. It's probably not so smart, but I'm living like, I don't have an English degree. Like I'm not classically trained in story crafting. Like, yeah. you know, and she wasn't either, but here I am writing a novel and she did it. So I'm doing it, you know? Right. And it's, right. it's just really, it's, I don't know. She gave me this bravery and this confidence and this fearlessness that I think is, so important to spread on to the next generation, especially with my kids myself. But yeah, growing up with her was wild and crazy and eccentric and fun and, and the best in the the best. I love it. Did she pass on any, um, any writing tips uh, along the sure. way? Like um, I, I understand that like when you went to college and stuff, you pursued um, uh, cooking and, uh, yeah, so culinary. I did, theater, yeah. I did theater first. Okay, theater first. Okay. Yeah, I, have a, did... I have a degree of theater performance, which shocks zero. Um, <laughs> when people find that out, they're like, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I had these events last night and the, and yesterday during the day, and it was supposed to be a reading, a talk, and then a Q&A, and it turns yeah. straight up into stand-up comedy. Like, I go completely <laughs> rogue with a microphone. Like, it's just tales of the past with Victoria. Yeah, right. Um, I, I, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> Did she pass on any, any writing? She passed tips? On even, writing event. Yes. Even though you, you, uh, had a different path that it didn't yeah. look like you were going to be an author right. at, at first. The, so how, how did, how did she handle, you know, passing the gift on to you when it looked like you weren't going to pursue that path? Well, she was like yelling at me for a really long time to finish the book, finish the book, finish the book. And she read it um, without my permission or the beginning of it, at least, and was sobbing, telling me that if I didn't do it, she would spank me. And then if you know, I was grounded forever and then if I didn't write it, she was going to write it and steal it. So, you know, someone was going to tell that story because it was good. Yeah. And um, my mom, I, you know, like I said, I wasn't classically trained or formally trained. I learned at the school of Dot Frank, you know, and she passed away before I finished the novel. Um, but she did get to read a little bit of it, which was great. And she gave me some wonderful advice on how to be a writer and how to craft a story. And the f- most important one was to write a story you would want to read. I think that's really important because you, I'm a reader first. I care about books. I care about stories. I care about authors. I care about the art, the arc of the craft. And also when it's a very intimate act to read a book, like you're creating a world that goes into someone's head that lives with them for a couple of days, sometimes a month, sometimes a year. I mean, if you write a series, those are people that live in someone else's home, home, their head forever. You know, it becomes, if you have success, it becomes like, like, look at what happened with Bridgerton or, you know, star Wars or any, you know, like all these books, like, these things blow up game of thrones i mean it's normal like talk now it's in social media it's in everywhere you go so you're injecting a story into the world and so if you're going to do that if you write a book you want to read you're going to create a good space and also to tell the truth um even if you're writing fiction because fiction is truth truth is fiction and if it's not believable then 
you're going to lose the protagonist. You're going to lose your audience. You're gonna lose, the book is going to be a mess. You have to tell the truth so the reader can identify with what the protagonist is saying and the journey. So those are probably the two biggest pieces of advice. Um, and what else? There's always an excuse not to write. So try to get oh, your ass in the chair. Always. Yeah. yeah that's always. It. Yeah. It's yeah. butt in the chair. That's all it is. Like that's 80% yeah. of it. Yeah. yeah. Butt in chair, hands on keyboard. That's Hands on keyboard. Keep it moving. You can clean yeah. up a mess. You can't <laughs> clean up nothing. So put something down. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So um, this book, My Magnolia Summer, um, yeah. was this the book that you had started and then mm -hmm. your mom threatened you to, to finish? Mm -hmm. So what take us back to the very beginning. Um, okay. I, I'm fascinated by where stories are born because yeah. in, in one moment, the story does not exist in any form or fashion. Yeah. And then either a character walks onto the stage of your mind and you're like, Oh, what's she up to? Or, or maybe you're visiting, uh, you know, the low country and, mm -hmm. and you know, you, you look out and this thing just starts, whatever it is, whatever that catalyst yeah. is, then the story is there and it's your job as the writer to dig it out, excavate it, polish it, it up. An and then, yeah, and, it, and then the book is born. Yeah. So what, what was that, that moment of creation for you? Ooh, I got to think about that. I don't know. It was such an organic. And even now, like with the book I'm working on now, it's, it's sort of the t characters are sort of talking to me without sounding like I need to be in a facility. Um, yeah. this, <laughs> this is a safe I, place to talk. Yeah. Like that. <laughs> It's a mental Trust health me. place. Good to know that I'm great. I cannot talk about all this. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I think it started from me being inspired by other books. You know, I mean, because I, I'm a reader first, like I said. Yeah. So I loved the Yaya Sisterhood, and I loved Steel Magnolias, and I loved Fried Green Tomatoes, and I wanted to read a book like that. And I went to the bookstore, and there was nothing that I hadn't already read. And I know there's Southern fiction. My mom wrote 20 books and she, and her books, like I love them, but I wanted more. I wanted something else. I wanted to fill, I wanted to scratch that itch, you know? So yeah. I was like, what, let me try to do that myself, which of course is highly ambitious. And you know, the whole time you have like massive imposter syndrome. Um, but I just started to hack away at it. And I thought, you know, let me make a character who is like me but not me and let me go through these problems that I have in a fictitious setting. Um, and it's funny. It's like when I decided I wanted to write plot started coming to me and that's sort of how it is now too. Like I'll hear a story or a conversation or a piece of music and I'll be like, Ooh, 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 let me tap into that. Like how can I work that into my story? And sometimes I just get on the computer and just start typing and it just comes out. I don't really know that's what I'm talking about. It's a gift. Like it literally just, you got to show up every day to your computer and, and yeah. honor it as it pours out of you. I, I think I heard your mom or I, I know I heard your mom uh, tell this story uh, uh, sometime in the past where she was talking about the beginning of her writing career and how she wanted to buy uh, f the family home. Yes. And, yes. and, her mom's and home. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then your, your dad and her, you know, kind of had this, yeah. you know, he said, no, we're not doing it. Oh and, my God. You know, yeah. and kind of, he kind of put the challenge, you know, we'll, you know, write a book, make the money and, and do it yourself. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, that, that story kind of, became legendary of you know and how her true. writing career and literally she's like i'm gonna buy that book i'm gonna write i'm gonna write that book i'm gonna buy that house and you can't come in you know and that's what it was <laughs> right. she, you well, know basically that's what happened so well, when i started reading my magnolia summer and i kind of understood the the setup of the story it yeah. it kind of echoes that story a little bit in a way um where yeah. where magnolia has has family there and she she winds up coming back and reconnecting and i i could feel the 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 ghost of your mother's story there cool. if you, it's it's obviously not uh not just like your mom's story but but i kind of felt like i've heard yeah. this story before i've heard something like it was was that an inspiration to were, were there no. homages at mm -hmm. all i mean i did i put some of her characters in my book you know as little easter eggs for the readers but no i i you know, it's funny. They're like a lot of the reviews that have come out have said that they're like, they're in the style of Dot Frank, but it's still her own style. But right. I am the style of Dot Frank. You know what yeah. I mean? So of course my book would be like her a little bit like hers, but yeah. a little different. I'm my own person, but I'm definitely her kid. 
Like the more well, time you spend with me, you'd be like, oh yeah, that's little Dottie. I mean, yeah. yeah. Well, when you hear her voice every day of your life, it yeah, her voice it is right influencing what you do. It has to. Right. And we're both very tied to the low country. And I think yeah. missing the low country was a theme in all of her books. You know, and for me, I went through that a little bit when I lived in New York. I missed coming back here. This is always, even though I grew up in New Jersey, this has always been home. Like I've always been called to this land. And I think space and rooting and location are, is very, very important. A sense of yeah. what home is. I think it's different for everybody, but on some level, if you stand, like if you're Irish and you go to Ireland, you're going to feel the memory that space has of those stories and those legends and how the landscape is so, especially here in Charleston, the landscape is a character on its own, you know? So you, yes. when you live here and you're like, or you spend time here, you're romanced by it. And if you have any kind of historical or blood relation to the land, I think you can't get it out of your system once you've been here. Like if I'm angry, I'm definitely from New Jersey, but every day. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm from South Mississippi and, and I feel that same connection that yeah. it, I, we lived out West for a while in, in Colorado and oh. I was still a Mississippi boy in Colorado. You know, it, yeah, you can't it, shake it. You, you know, can't like, shake it. It's yeah, just it, there's it. something about the soil. The tomatoes were grown in or something. And I say it's, it's just, a fluff mud between your toes. It's just, you know, it's right. the same. Yeah. You, it's all you same. can take the boy yeah. out of Mississippi, but yeah, it's right. Yeah. And I lived in New Jersey and I lived in Manhattan and I lived in Connecticut and I, I did all that. And there's certainly part of, of those places as well that have influenced and shaped me. But I think, I think the South, especially we're so prideful of, of our area, you know, and we're so like, like Louisiana is a really good example of that. Like I never understood Mardi Gras until I went to New Orleans and saw the Mardi Gras museum <laughs> and like met people that were like, my great grandmother was a page and bought, I'm like, what? Like that just seems like a Halloween situation. <laughs> oh no. It's like super serious. And I, I love that. Like pride of your, where you're from. Yeah. It's so cool. And, and I think Charleston for me, I've never been proud of New Jersey, but I'm very <laughs> proud. But I will say this, there ain't nothing like a Jersey girl. Like we are strong, resilient, funny, loyal. Like we got your back. We're going to tell you the truth, even if it hurts your feelings. Like it's nice. Jersey women are great. Um, yeah. And it's cool because now everyone in South Carolina is from New Jersey. So it's fine. Everyone's well, moving here. <laughs> and it's so funny because we, we have a um, – I don't know if you'd call it a, a genre or a distinction or what, but we, we talk about Southern literature. Yeah. Um, nobody talks, it's nobody bad. talks about Midwestern literature or Northeastern literature. It's not, not a thing. Uh, because nobody moves to those places. Those are places you move away from and you don't want to take the North to the beach. True. True. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like you don't move to New York. I mean, maybe for, as a career, but you don't move. Okay. You don't move to Connecticut. Right. You move to South Carolina or even Mississippi. I mean, you know, and you don't move away from it either. Like even when you do, you return. Right. The South has been romanticized in literature forever um, yeah. in, in good ways and in bad ways, obviously. Of course. But, but there's always been a fascination with being Southern. My mother and I always said everyone secretly wants to be Southern. And I think it's true. I think it's true too. Mm -hmm. I do. You know, um, so your mother gave you the challenge, finish this book or yeah. you know, she's going to beat you over the head, spank you, what, you know, whatever. Yes. Yeah. What were, what was the, the motivation? What was the catalyst to, you know, take the story that you'd kind of piddled with, you know, for years and, you know, really get after it? I think it was a challenge, you know, and it, it's a love letter to my mom too, in a way, like just. And I didn't, in, I didn't really know that as I was writing it, but reading the finished product now and knowing where I am in my personal journey and in life, I can see that that's exactly what this book is. It's a love letter to carrying on legacy within a family. And that's what I'm doing intentionally right. or not, you know? So I think the kick in the butt came really from my father that was like, you need to finish this. Like, this is just ridiculous. It's sitting, it's good. It's good work. Like you're being stupid. You know, like, I don't care if you are insecure or whatever, like you're being stupid. Right. And I was like, okay. You know, and I really literally the entire time I thought it was just my mom and dad. Cause I was their kid 
thought I could do it. You know, I wasn't really good. Like I, I didn't have any real, real talent. Like I was funny. I knew I was funny and yeah. I knew I could like get a microphone and make a crowd happy. And I know I can sell. So like those two things and she can kind of write a book. We got an author. That's what I thought it was. But turns out that's not true. turns out I'm not so bad at it. I'm not, I'm okay. I mean, there are better authors out a lot, a lot more better than me. <laughs> Um, some of them who have endorsed this book, which I'm like, have you lost your mind? Thank you. Like, two of them, and I am waiting for everyone to like, I'm waiting for Ann Patchett to call me and be like, I was just doing that as a favor. Right. But she didn't, she, she didn't. And she'd like to have people in my field, I guess now who believe in my work. It's just, it's surreal. This whole thing is so weird. Like it's so surreal. It's I lived with this book for so long and it wasn't done, wasn't done, wasn't done, wasn't done. And then it was done and sold and now it's coming out. It's like, look, yeah. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> you know, like I had it on my desk for seven years. Like, it yeah. was, I, and in that time I grew up, I went from being a girl to a woman. My mom passed away. I had two kids. I got married. I mean, not in that order, but you know, there was like so yeah. much stuff that was so many big life events that changed me. So Maggie changed too, my main character. She grew up do, in her book. Do you feel like that that you had to go through those life experiences to be able to bring those experiences 100%. to the book? Yes, absolutely. And I think when I started writing my book, I was 30, 31. Um, and I think I was not experienced enough to really bring authenticity and grit to the page. I hadn't gone through something horrific, like losing your mother. Yeah. I hadn't been scared. Like when you go through... Also, I think I'm funnier now because I've gone through such such dark times. I mean, like it, you can't, um, you can't write and access that part of your soul unless it's been really rocked. Like I, you yeah. know, losing my mother was horrific. It was horrific and tragic. I was pregnant with my daughter. I mean, it was like literally, if you wrote the worst situation in normal circumstances, that was what it was for me and my family and it was fast and it was unexpected and it was just so traumatic. So I think instead of leaning into the depression that could have easily happened, I decided to do something with it and channel it into my book because I, I sound like so full of myself right now, but like, I really am living for my mom now and she can't write. I can. So let's do it. Like, Let's let's sell the shit out of this book. You right. know what I mean? Like, right. like, like let's write the <laughs> hell out of it. Like let's, right. do, let's not just write something funny. Let's make them cry. Let's you know, it's like the whole I want to pull everything out and work twice as hard. Um yeah. and just be a total, totally devoted to this because one, it turns out I can. And two, what a what a way to honor my mom. What a way to honor your mom. Absolutely. Yeah. So let's, let's talk about the book specifically. Okay. We, we've okay. talked all around the book. Let's talk, talk about all around book. her. Yeah, we have <laughs> Maggie where yeah. uh, Magnolia, wh where did this character come from? I don't know. Pe people ask me this all the time. Where do you get your inspiration for characters? I don't know. No, I think Maggie there. was me. I think I created the situation and then Maggie was me reacting to it. And then everybody else in the, in the novel was an opposite of what I had experienced. Also not intentional, but I, I knew the mother daughter relationship would be a bad one because I had such a good one. So I wanted right. to explore what that felt like. Cause I have a lot of women in my life that have terrible relationships or, or complicated with their mother. Um, yeah. So I wanted to write a bad one. Gran, I didn't really know my grandmothers. So I thought, would it be cool to be raised by your grandma? And what would that look like? You know? So I wrote her, um, I don't have a sister, so I wrote a sister, you know, I just, I just sort of play, it was playing. It was, this is really the first half of this book is my exercise, my workbook of how I learned how to write, you know, I, it's, it's self-taught yeah. writing is self-taught. I mean, you can of learn, course. you can take classes, but you got to sit there and do the work. So I think that that's, I, I don't know where Maggie came from part. Maybe it's another personality I have. I don't know. <laughs> a redheaded so, personality. So this is a story of Maggie coming home. Yes. Um, what uh, talk a little bit about the the setup for the book? If if people don't know anything about it, kind of what's what's going on with these characters and and who is Maggie and what what is she getting herself into? So Maggie is a late twenties, early thirty something, who is living currently in New York City, and she's an aspiring chef, which I was. 
Um, she has beautiful red hair and green eyes, which I have blue eyes and black hair. I've always wanted, <laughs> I've always wanted green eyes and red hair. Turns out my daughter has that, by the way, I birthed her. Next time I'm going to write a book about winning the lottery and see what happens. There you um, go. Yeah. <laughs> so she's a, an aspiring chef. She's from the low country. She grew up, um, in Solis Island and they had a restaurant in their family called the magic lantern, which is based off of a restaurant that was in my family in Charleston. That was my great grandmother's in the thirties and the forties, which is pretty cool. Um, and so she, her grand who raised her gets in an accident and she gets a call from her sister in the middle of service one night at the restaurant in New York. And she rushes back down South to be by her grandmother's side. And she realizes that she might lose her. And in the process, she also realizes that the restaurant is not what it once was, that it's it's falling up down around her ears and it's losing its integrity. It's losing its like strength, its history, all, all that its legacy. It's been turned into this nasty, cheap seafood restaurant and it's just sacrilegious to her and she's horrified. <laughs> and so she realizes that they need her help and she can't make up her mind. And it takes until the end of the book, really, for her to decide, do I stay home or do I continue to live my life in New York? Or can I have both? And then there's a love story woven in and there's relationships between her mother and her grand and her sister. And it's about rising to the occasion, rising to the challenge. You mentioned um, earlier, and, and I meant to say this uh, earlier, but but you talking there just kind of brought it back up that that you you said that it wasn't until the end of the book that you started realizing kind of what this book was and uh isn't it funny how themes um kind of present themselves yeah at the end? and and i've always been fascinated when people say you know i wrote this book because i had this theme in mind and, and this was an exploration of and that has never worked like that for me no. it's always that it's something that i've wrestled with uh, you yeah know, deep down and i didn't even know it or or it's, maybe it's, i did yeah, but this had nothing to do with that subconscious questions that come out and yeah. i think that the death of my mother was also that that's a, a hidden theme in there and also like my embarking on my career now i mean i was going to be a writer beforehand like i was my mom was alive we were we wrote teddy spaghetti together like this was right. going to be the path that was going to be my door into the world that's not what happened um but you know, the arc of Maggie's professional decisions mirrors what's happening to me now. And I never intended that. I never, I thought it was going to be a love story. I thought this was going to be like borderland ro like Roma romance. And it just never did that. It turned out to be something else entirely, which, you know, all the best stories are They're all. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. But it's funny um, that you said that that's what it is. It's like internal questions. You don't even know that you have writing the book was my way of working that out. I just didn't exactly. realize that. Exactly. Yeah. And that, that happens with me all the time. I, I'd never yeah. set out to, to say something. It just, yeah. The thing there's no just message. comes out. Yeah. There's, right. there's no message that like sometimes, yeah. Like I see, yeah. I mean, I guess it's about finding your own voice and standing up for yourself and all those things, but like it wasn't intentional. I'm letting my characters tell their story and within the story, there's a theme. I mean, maybe there's a lesson in there. Maybe, maybe you and I need to look look at our lives and see where the arc's going. You know, talk to the right. writer. We need to exactly. see an outline. I want to know what happens in the next chapter. <laughs> so I don't have exactly. so much anxiety. <laughs> exactly. The 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 um the setting is so lush and beautiful in this book. You really transport us into the world of the story. The yeah. characters are uh you just I, I, I fell in love with with you know, 80 characters and you know, you. there's just so much going on here. Um, will you continue to take us to this world? Oh, hell yeah. My <laughs> second book is a, is a sequel. So I am, okay. I am so into the low country. Like it's, I am in love with it. I, and it possesses me. Like I just, I mean, there's a line in there. I think it's in the, one of the first lines where she listens to the, the breeze push through the fronds of the palmetto trees. And you just think about, what that sounds like. Like if you ever yeah. get a chance to listen to the fronds of a palmetto trees in a windstorm, it sounds like it's hypnotic. You know, yeah. you're like, Oh, like <laughs> go right to sleep. <laughs> and I think, you know, Spanish moss and knotty oaks and rolling angry tempests in the ocean and dunes. And the, you know, I mean, there's just so much to write about yet. Yeah, and it smell, it's all sensory. It smells so yeah. good and it feels so good. And there's something in the air that happens 
every time the seasons switch that like sort of is the start of a next story, you know? So there's, oh yeah, I think a landscape plays a huge part. It's the main character, if not a supporting one. Yeah. Well, as of yesterday, this book is out everywhere. Um, And I know that the, the journey of a book is, uh, is, is crazy. This has likely been off of your desk for quite a while um, already while you went through edits and, and yeah. all of that stuff. And you did mention that you're writing a sequel. Um, yeah. What's, what's kind of the status of the sequel? Where, where are you in that process? We are like 75 pages in. Okay. So, so the ch- a good hunk. Um, yeah. I have to start getting down to business now um, after this tour, which, you know, has been going on for two days. So, but I'm, yeah. I'm at my desk right now in between stops. So I'm like, Oh my God, I want to get writing, but I, <laughs> I don't have time. Um, it is. So it's the sister story and I can't tell too much about it because it'll spoil the first one because yeah. they build on each other. Um, but it's the same thing. It's the same theme of stepping up to the occasion. And when life gives you circumstances, how are you going to respond to it? And how you craft your ability and identity as a, and as an adult, as a woman, um, and how you let those circumstances shape you. And you, are you going to lean into the bad stuff? Or are you going to triumph? Are you going to champion your, it's about being your own champion. I love it. My Magnolia Summer is available everywhere now. If you, uh, if you uh, prefer to read on your Kindle uh, or uh listen to the audio book um we're gonna have links in the show notes where you can go to amazon and grab it or go visit your local bookstore support local books and you can grab a hardcover edition just like i have yes local bookstores are my favorite absolutely absolutely um victoria if people are just discovering you and want to go along the journey with you uh what's the best place for them to find you online and dig into all the great stuff you're up to Instagram is the easiest way at Victoria Benton Frank. Um, I am on there all the time and usually I'm being really silly on it. I'm not, <laughs> sometimes it's book related and sometimes it's just coming with me to the fondue restaurant. Like I don't, you know, you don't know. Could be my ratchet children. I, <laughs> this could be anything. <laughs> um, I'm on Facebook as well, although currently in Facebook jail, but you can find me. It happens. It, it happens. I don't know. I, we don't know what happens. Harper's like looking into it. Um, but my personal account, Victoria Peluso on Facebook, I'm right now. And then my mother's account, I also oversee. So you can get in contact. I'm very able to get in contact with. <laughs> Great. We'll <laughs> link up all the... We'll link up all those places and make it easier for folks to find you. Victoria, this has been so much fun chatting. Oh, Please yeah. come back and let's do it again. Oh, I would love it. I'd love it. I want to come to Mississippi. I want to play with everything that's on your shelf over there. All those toys come, and the uh, Gandalf staff in the back and the yeah. sword. Like, I'm into it. Like, come, come on. Come on. We'll go on, a, <laughs> on an adventure. Yay. <laughs> Thanks, Victoria. Thank you. That's our episode for today. There's so much more to come as we talk with authors about the craft of writing, but also the business of publishing. Be sure to subscribe to the StoryCraft Cafe podcast in your favorite podcast app to never miss an episode. The StoryCraft Cafe is made possible by Dabble. Writing a book is challenging. Your writing tool shouldn't be. Dabble is an easy-to-use online writing tool packed with helpful features that allow beginning novelists and published authors to create amazing stories. Visit us at dabblewriter.com and start your free trial. Thanks for listening.